So very good morning to uh, all of you and very early good morning to uh, uh, our friend Ender who is uh, from California who is uh, joining us for this, uh, for this event. He couldn't be here in person but I think that uh, his presentation uh, was a lot for, for the debate we are going to have. So you have been uh, you know, listening on the first panel and that was a, a beautiful introduction also for what we are going to touch right now because you have seen that uh, the world is going into uh, new applications, uh, very critical <coughs> applications. And uh, what we want to touch today is what is the industry behind it? I mean, how is it uh, going to happen and why? And uh, what are the forces that really drive these uh, uh, innovations? And you know that uh, the complications today is not only technology, it's all about also the geopolitical around it. So, we are going to touch this, and in the debate also, we want to make sure that uh, as we go into the discussions, we also talk about this uh, part of the world, the Gulf regions. Uh, if, you, if you talk about uh, you know, innovation, if you talk about leadership, if you talk about sovereignty, it is very important that uh, uh, you understand also that uh, it, it is a critical uh, industry for this part of the world as well. So with that, <coughs> I, I want to make sure that uh, uh, you, we will have uh, first an introduction with uh, Andel Jones, uh, who is going to, uh, again, talk from California. We, uh, Helmut is uh, uh, on, my, uh, on my left here first, and uh, we'll, um, Helmut has been uh, uh, playing in the uh, industry for more than 30 years in the semiconductor industry, and, he will, and you have his in, uh, bio into, the, into the, the documents here. With Max, Max, uh, I will only say that Max is uh, traveling around the world, he is the innovation makers, he's one of these uh, few people in the world who are really connecting the dots, and uh, again, I make sure that you read uh, his bio, it's very, very important. So with that, Andal, maybe I'll turn it to you, and uh, we start into the debate just after that. Today I'm going to talk about the underlying capabilities of AI, which is semiconductors. So if we're going to slide two, I basically will give some background on myself and also uh, the company. So IBS has been in business about 33 years. We work with most of the major semiconductor companies. We also work with financial institutions, but we also work extensively with governments. Uh, we worked with the US government uh, on their strategies for semiconductors. I spent a lot of time in China regarding semiconductors in China. And we also interfaced with the French government. We actually had a high level discussion with the French government last week. Uh, also, Japan, uh, also Taiwan. Uh, now we're also doing some work for India and also potentially Vietnam. So we work on a global basis, and, the, and also a key part of what we do is focusing on the growth and evolution of AI, and then focusing very heavily on the semiconductor support for AI. And of course, the key part of the essence of AI is data, and in some ways data has similarity to oil. But also I'm going to cover why semiconductors have become so important in the last few years. And one, of course, is now the governments of many countries are involved. Also the supply chain issues. But the third factor, which is that of the emergence of generative AI, which is going to change multiple industries. And I'll cover some of those points. But I'll focus very heavily on the semiconductor supply that is needed to support AI. Can we go to slide three, please? So we see AI today in smartphones. The camera functionality in smartphones is based on AI. And this is the beginning. Basically, we're going to see many, many new applications emerging. In the automobile industry, we see some of the consumption in 2030 at about 2,500 per vehicle compared to $500 in 2020. And of course, a key part of that is the self-driving capability that will emerge. 
NVIDIA, of course, has had very high visibility recently in terms of data centers. And we can think of data centers in some ways as equivalent to oil refineries. A large amount of data goes in and the data is processed. And then, of course, the utilization of data is very widespread. And of course, the key building block function of AI is that of the GPU of NVIDIA, where they produce what it costs them about $3,000 to make it, but they sell it for $50,000 and there are global shortages. So this is the beginning of what we call generative AI and the impact initially is in the data centers, but we will see widespread use at the edge devices and the edge applications in future, which can produce major opportunities for, for countries in the Middle East, in Europe, in the US and in other global regions. Can we go to slide four, please? So governments are becoming increasingly active in uh, semiconductors. And of course, the initial driver was that of supply chains. Cars could not be shipped because of uh, lack of semiconductors. So we now see the joint venture between Global Foundries and STM, ST Micro in Kroll. We see a fab in Germany for TSMC. We see a fab in Germany for Intel. Uh, the US Chips Act is producing some money. So governments are now actively involved in decision processes for semiconductors. This was not the case in the past. And of course, AI will, in, will increase the involvement of the governments. Let's go to slide five, please. So the semiconductor market will be a trillion dollars in 2030. IBS along with SEMI predicted this back in 2017. So of course, this is a huge industry with significant growth potential, but it's very fragmented in terms of many different products. Let's go to slide six. So a trade war has emerged in the semiconductor industry. And um, yeah, so let's go to slide, uh, next slide, slide seven. Let's go one more slide. Let's go one more slide. Yeah, thank you. This is the one I want. So uh, a trade war has emerged uh, between the US and China in semiconductors. And of course, a part of it was supply chain issues. But US sees China as becoming a major competitor in terms of semiconductors. But the real emphasis right now is on artificial intelligence. Uh, the key building blocks for um, semiconductors in terms of the um, artificial intelligence are processors. And this is where there's right now a trade war between US and China regarding supply chain of processors. Also, the AI is increasingly important in the military applications. Drones rely very heavily on AI. And of course, software for military intelligence is a key factor in terms of the AI arena. Let's go to the next slide. So China, though, is moving rapidly in building semiconductor capabilities. And uh, I've been there, I just came back over just about a week or so ago. And this is my third visit to China this year. I spent about six weeks in China this year. And we do see a rapid progress in a number of areas. And of course, China has a large number of highly skilled engineers uh, and Chinese government's providing large funding. The role though of Taiwan is critical. TSMC is producing approximately 60% of the foundry market and 90% of advanced feature technologies. Apple, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, all these companies depend on TSMC. What's gonna to happen to TSMC in the future? That's a question for another discussion. And basically we do have significant visibility into what some of the potential options are. Let's go to the next slide. So generative AI is effectively a new capability within the semiconductor industry. Generative AI is the ability to develop software, which then allows tasks to be addressed very effectively. Chat GPT can create content, but the real value of generative AI is development of software, which then allows uh, new applications to emerge. We heard in the last presentation about digital health. 
that's going to be a biggest one of the biggest growth industries in 2030 to 2040. And generative AI and semiconductors are a key part of that. Also, sensors will be a key part of that. And of course, sensor capability and sensor leadership is in Europe. And in generative AI, we think it will be important to have global collaboration, or collaboration between countries that have different skill sets, but also different requirements. So this is a new era for the semiconductor industry. And again, generative AI is a new capability which will revolutionize many applications. Let's go to the next slide, please. And let's go to the next slide. Let's go, the, yeah, so generative AI basically is the ability, as I mentioned, to generate models. And the initial activities of generative AI is in data centers. And as I mentioned, NVIDIA, their revenue data centers in 2014 was 199 million. This year will be 40 billion. So what IBS has done is quantified the value of generative AI. And uh, if we go to the next slide, okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah, basically we looked at each product category and then looked at the value of AI. And this is what we have in terms of the impact of AI in 2030. Let's go to the next slide. So AI will represent $760 billion out of a total of a trillion dollars of the semiconductor industry. This really is a, has a huge impact in terms of semiconductor production, semiconductor supply, but also now increasing government control over semiconductors. Let's go to the next slide. This shows a similar perspective, but now based on a percentage basis. So this, this, this is going to change the semiconductor industry, supply chains, and again, it's going to produce many new opportunities. Let's go to the next slide. So what we see in the semiconductor market as a summary is the market will decline this year, but will grow next year, and then basically fairly strong growth between now and 2030. The trade war between US and China, though, however, will become more contentious. Uh, we're seeing more restrictions being placed on China, and it's actually hurting China. Uh, China is trying to do um, some uh, mature technologies, and that's going to be okay for a while. However, though, there's going to be a point where China will push back, and that's going to create potentially significant supply chain issues on a global basis. When will it occur? Maybe 2025, 2026, maybe 2027, but it's going to happen. Uh, so again, the trade war issues have some basis for national security, other areas that we question. And again, I, but the end result is China is making huge investments in semiconductors, but as I said, there will be significant escalation of the conflict in the future. Let's go to the next slide. So the growth of the semiconductor market right now is driven quite heavily by smartphones, by data centers, but basically we're gonna see edge devices being the key factor in terms of generative AI. So what are the applications? Well, it was mentioned earlier, digital health. This is revolutionary. I've been exposed to some activities in Stanford, in Harvard, and we will have major benefits in terms of uh, reduction or decreased importance of diseases, uh, longer lifetimes, uh, more productive lifetimes, so this is going to change society. And of course, it's going to take large resources. It's also going to take collaboration. Food production is another area where there are going to be significant benefits from generative AI. The education system will need to change dramatically. What is being learned today will become obsolete with generative AI. What people will have will be what we call a virtual digital twin, which will have higher IQ in terms of data analysis than the human brain. We'll have autonomous transportation, of course. Uh, this will change logistics. We think China will actually be the first market to adopt um, generative AI and L5 ADAS. Maybe 2035, but it's going to come. So we're going to have major changes in society. Yes, we have we concern about the, uh, the dangers of AI, but it's important to, uh, to 
accept AI and try and accelerate the adoption because the benefits will far outweigh the limitations of AI. So thank you very much. That is my presentation. I wish I could have more time. I wish I could be there, but again, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. And you stay with us if you can, right? So um, what we are hearing from uh, you know, the previous panel and what uh, Andrew is uh, sharing with us is that uh, we, are bec we are going into a new era. I mean, we have been through the, the gold era, the uh, oil and gas era, and now we are entering into this uh, semiconductor era. I mean, this is a very critical phase, and this is going to be there for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So it is clearly um, an opportunity to, uh, for some government also to get into the game, as uh, Endel was sharing. But is it really true? I mean, um, Max, what do you think about this? Well, first of all, good morning to all of you. Salam alaikum. Um, it's always good to be back in United Arab Emirates, and my gratitude to the organizer committing uh, Monsieur Montbriol, Ma Madame Kwan, and the Cillian partners, founders, Helmut and Paul, for allowing me to be on the stage with them. Um, it's a distinct honor and a privilege to be here with you. Um, it's, it's really interesting because semiconductor industry, uh, let me give you some dates for backdrop. Uh, the first transistor, which is the genesis of integrated circuit, was invented in Bell Labs in 1947. Uh, ten years later, in 1958, uh, Jack Kilby created integrated circuit, which was basically assembly of a bunch of transistors to create functions. Over the last 40 years, semiconductor industry has contributed so immensely to our lives being enriched, to the society being the way it is today, and unfortunately, majority of the people don't know the contribution of the semiconductor industry. But the last 40 years and half a trillion dollars worth of revenue will be dwarfed in the next decades on what contribution semiconductor industry can bring and what economic value it brings to countries that they participate in the semiconductor industry that any, any innovation it brings. Um, probably all of you have a cell phone in your pocket. The last 40 years semiconductor industry has transformed computing and communication industry to the point that today you take your phone out, you can FaceTime your friends and family without even understanding how all of that has become possible. Um, Single-handedly, our industry owes a debt of gratitude to a gentleman who was the founder of Intel, which you probably all know because the sticker is on your laptop, uh, by the name of Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore's law, which became known as Moore's Law, dictated that every two years, the number of transistors on a chip to grow to become double, and, and as such, the semiconductor industry has followed that pattern and created more efficient chips every year at same or reduced cost. And as a result, it has made possible innovations that has created the, the communication and computing industry that you see today. Those devices that you have generate data. Data is the genesis, and, and I hesitate to mention AI again because everybody is, talks about AI, but it's important to understand why AI has, I think the professor before us explained it very eloquently, that AI, AI is not new. It is actually a very old idea, but the advent of semiconductors and, and the computing architecture today available has allowed AI to flourish. And, and again, I like to focus on the positives of the AI, such as uh, ability to be able to detect tumors that professional doctors with 30 years of experience couldn't do. So there is plenty of opportunities. And if you look at where the chip industry is today, give you a frame of reference 
which is quite honestly for me, for all of us in this industry that we've been around for a long time, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around it. The NVIDIA, the AMD, and Intel's Ponte Vecchio each have somewhere between 100 to 150 billion transistors in it. So if, 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 if you look at the genius of these devices, that they are crunching data, and the ability that they are bringing to the society, it's, it's mind-boggling what will be happening. And, and you saw uh, Hendel's eloquent uh, analysis of where the industry is headed. In the last 40 years, the industry has become a half a trillion dollar industry. In the next seven to eight years, the industry will double its size and become $1.1 trillion industry. Now, why is CHIPS Act so important? Why is every country and every society trying to have a control over semiconductors? Because from one side, if you look at it from advanced agri agriculture to drones and to computing AI platforms, it is the genesis of the new industrial revolution. Semiconductors are what makes it, makes it happen. But from the other side of it, it's, it's part of sovereign uh, protection of, of individual societies. Each country needs to have access to the technology for their protection. So semiconductors have a dual use capability these days. And, and, and in all honesty, uh, I, I, I am so happy that after the pandemic and shortage of cars because of semiconductors, at least now my family knows what I'm doing. Because up to that point, they didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, th th this is true. I mean, this is not an industry that is really marketing itself, but this is really the foundation for most of the innovations that we see today. And these innovations are, are going to basically uh, continue to spread over, over time. So uh, we have built, uh, basically we have built over, over, over time, uh, we have built this uh, uh, capability, computing capabilities that you are talking about, Max. Uh, we also uh, built these communication capabilities, really, that really drives, you know, 4G going into 5G and tomorrow it will be 6G. So it's a lot of also different type of applications, but it is needed. So the, the Lego itself, I mean, the constructions, the, the architecture is now ready to the next step because we have these high computing, high level computing models uh, that are running um, with these uh, capabilities. We have this ability to really go fast and move the information very fast. We still have a lot of problem to fix, okay? And, and power is going to be a, a lot of this uh, uh, situations where the industry is going to continue to focus. But as Andol is saying, we want to bring these models close to the applications. We want to make sure that uh, this, uh, uh, whatever we call it, artificial intelligence or ability to do more with uh, less at uh, the point of use, this is what uh, the industry is going to bring uh, in, the, in the future. So if, if you think about that, uh, you understand also uh, why uh, U.S. versus China uh, is, is going on right now. I mean, this is uh, clearly a sovereignty uh, part of the discussions. We understand the policy makers that uh, you guys are, are here for, and this is so important for this industry. But, uh, Elmut, back to you. I mean, what, what do you think? Uh, how do you think? Uh, what do you think about Europe in this race? I mean, how do you see Europe? Uh, acting and and uh, what are the potential strengths and weaknesses that you see uh, um, in Europe? Well, that's two questions. Well, good morning, everybody. First and foremost, also a pleasure for me to talk about my favorite subject, semiconductors. Um, I've spent all of my professional life in semiconductors, and I'm as happy as you are, Max, the f to the fact that finally um, a large portion of society recognizes how relevant it is, and. That's one of the reasons why um, the tensions um, between US and China um, have gained so much attention. Um, because in Taiwan, there's a super high concentration of semiconductor manufacturing, in particular advanced semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, Handel uh, showed some numbers on that. Um, why is that critical? No car, no phone, no internet would be possible today 
without that particular manufacturing in Taiwan. Now, what have people thought about that? Two things. We want to regionalize manufacturing, Div diversify the manufacturing landscape. It's got to be in other places. And, and uh, Handel also said, well, uh, TSMC is venturing into the US, into Japan, into Europe. Um, uh, Intel is uh, bringing their manufacturing into Germany, for instance. Many things are happening at this point in time. And, and change is always an opportunity for those who are courageous enough to drive it. So it's the opportunity, um, I think, for many, for many countries, for many companies, to, to participate in that change and make a fortune out of it. It doesn't come by itself. And as I said, I do believe it takes quite a bit of courage to do that. But there's another point that is relevant. When uh, we are talking about Taiwan and this particular strength and concentration in Taiwan on this particular capability, the semiconductor industry is a lot broader. We are talking about a very relevant, specific point. But the 600 billion or whatever the number was um, in 2022 of uh, value that was uh, uh, created or, or revenue that was generated is on the so-called device level. These devices have to be manufactured. These the, for those manufacturing, we need to have equipment. And for that to run, it needs material. If you add all those different steps of the value chain together, you are at a trillion already. Already today you are. And these other areas are way more diversified. The concentration of, of uh, um, capability in Taiwan is focused on manufacturing of leading edge technology only. Um, there is a lot of other things that are being manufactured, designed, and value created in other regions. For instance, in Europe, and you were asking about the Europe, P and Engel to this, besides the benefit of, of uh, Europe now getting from advanced manufacturing being brought into the region, Europe has its own strength in certain areas. One is automotive. Um, I'd say 50% of the semiconductors for automotive are being designed and to a large extent manufactured in Europe today. So it is a a very great strength. Um, we also talked about equipment. There is this famous company, everybody has heard the acronym. Meanwhile, it's called ASML. Why is ASML so critical? Because they're the only company in the world that can enable so-called leading edge technology. But again, leading edge is only a certain portion of the semiconductor industry, a critical one that has a lot of focus, also because of potential dual use to it. But again, there's a lot of other things that are being done in Europe right now, today, um, where Europe is leading um, um, the, the global effort in certain areas. And material is the third one, and, and um, Paul has been running a company called Soitec for, for many years. Again, a capability in Europe that is unique to this industry and is very critical for development of certain specific areas. So if you go a level deeper in trying to understand what semiconductors are all about, you recognize that each region, US for instance, owns design automation. No chip can be made, no chip in this world, without the, um, certain capability that resides in the US only. Japan owns um, uh, wafer, uh, certain areas of wafer capability and some materials. Um, uh, all of this leading edge lithography would not be possible without chemistry coming out of Japan. So this is a truly global industry. And yes, it is changing as we speak. And yes, we can take advantage of it. Every region has to look at what are the particular capabilities. And if you are brave enough to take advantage of the current change, you can bring this industry or a portion of this industry into this region as well, and we'll talk about that soon. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, but, but that comes, I mean, for me, uh, everything you said makes sense, and yes, Europe has uh, uh, very strong capabilities and uh, niches that really uh, bring this, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of the world in terms of, uh, into the club. By club, I mean, uh, if you want to enforce policy, you have to have something to say, you have to have also 
the ability to play a part in this technology world. And, uh, but what we said before is that everything starts with innovation. So is Europe slowing down on innovations? What is, Max, what is the, what is the situation when it comes to this industry, semiconductor industry? What do you, what do you think about innovations? You are the first, I mean, you are the right person to talk about it, by the way. So I think Paul refers to the fact that I am fortunate enough to represent an organization that has been the driving force uh, behind innovation in the semiconductor industry. Our organization is called IMEC. It's located in Belgium. We are truly global. Uh, we have over 5,500 of the brightest minds from 95 nationalities that they use an infrastructure that is in excess of four and a half billion dollars. And we are fortunate enough to collaborate with pretty much any company that is successful, um, including, I think we have a colleague here, here from Volkswagen, uh, including Volkswagen and car companies and uh, sequencing, DNA sequencing companies, besides the semiconductor industry. Um, you know, uh, semiconductor industry has different segments to it. There is the logic segment, there is the memory segment, there is sensing and actuate segment. Europe has been a prominent player in the sensing and actuate, which as you can see is, is driving the autonomous driving segment. Uh, and the company that Helmut was on the board is one of the pioneers in creating chips for this uh, automotive industry, Infineon a German company. So if you look at innovation in Europe, quite honestly speaking, uh, I would have to be forgiven because I am part of IMEC and I get a paycheck from IMEC, so I have to defend IMEC. But uh, if you look at the talent that the universities in Europe create, innovation is what has created semiconductor industry and has driven it forward to the point that the chip today has 150 billion transistors on it. Every aspect of the industry has been innovating. And, and quite honestly, the ecosystem has worked together. And, and the driving force of the ecosystem is the talent, is the innovation behind the industry. And Europe has played a significant role because if you look at the universities in Europe, the access to the universities, uh, it, it has a wealth of universities that they can still continue the innovation in the semiconductor industry. For us to continue to grow in the semiconductor industry, uh, if you look at AI, for example, or if you look at many of the applications, quite honestly speaking, if, if AI grows at the rate it's growing, the computing platform, the power that is required for that computing platform, the, the, the world doesn't have that much power. So we need to continue to innovate in order to reduce the power of consumption of the chip. We need to continue to innovate in order to increase the performance of the chips. So uh, I think each region needs to bring something to the table, but underlying part of the participation and the price for participation is to create workforce and talent that they can innovate at least part of this value chain. Thanks, Max. I think it's clear. I think it's clear that this is uh, the, new, uh, the new era. And as part of it, I mean, if you think about post-COVID and uh, the current uh, China-US tension, this industry is thinking about regionalizations. We have been building this industry for the last 30 years, thinking about globalizations. We are now thinking about regionalizations. If you think about the footprint, every single region in the world is trying to really get into, into this industry. They are trying to really attract and, and build uh, on this industry. So, so, Andal, I mean, there is a question for you. I mean, is it a good time? Is it the time? Is it the moment in life where uh, collaborations between Europe and, and the Gulf regions uh, should, uh, should materialize? 
And is it possible? Um, you know, the cement industry has different levels. We have the foundry level, and Mobidala has made a significant investment in global foundries. And it took a while, but now the uh, situation looks very positive. But the manufacturing uh, at the foundry level, or the manuf or the in, also for memory, is one level, and that is very capital intensive, and it also requires a lot of skills. The next level up is out of products, and of course, products need markets, and the markets, uh, <coughs> smartphones represent 35% of the market. The other level, though, is the applications, the software, and the um, solutions that can be brought to the market. So if you look at generative AI and where growth opportunities exist, as I mentioned earlier, digital health is one of those areas. So if you are going to collaborate, if the, if, if the Middle East is going to bring up its own industries related to AI, to me, digital health is one of the key areas. And, and, and why Europe? Well, Europe has leadership in sensors. The sensors developed by IMEC, Cialetti, uh, Bosch, uh, Infineon, ST. These are leadership on a global basis. So there could be collaboration in terms of the sensors that you can get from Europe. European companies also have some reasonably good processors. You can build industries like the uh, digital health based on collaboration. So you can utilize the infrastructure that is being built. You can, you can utilize the billions of dollars of capacity that is being built, but then develop new industries. Agriculture is another one. Uh, basically, pharmaceuticals is another one. So to me, the collaboration should be based on applications that benefit society, and the, where the benefits are tangible. And of course, there can be significant investments but the payback will be huge. So I, I, see, I see significant synergy between Europe and the Middle East. And frankly, I think the emergence of generative AI, companies like JATGBT, this is the perfect time to build new industries. And as has been said, as Paul mentioned, uh, basically we need to collaborate. No country can do everything by themselves. And again, I think right now is perfect timing to look at generative AI and then look at who the potential partners can be. And of course, they do involve political stability and relationships, as well as economic factors, as well as innovation, and of course, also the need for end markets. So to me, this is perfect time to focus on generative AI because it's at the early stages of emergence, but the applications and opportunities are very clear. So, Enmut, what, what is your view on that? And maybe if you want to get into uh, what what can be done in, in also uh, to get into win-win uh, situations, I think it's uh, it's an opportunity, but uh, but the train is moving, right? And uh, the, this is an industry who doesn't stop. I mean, clearly. It is about speed and it is about also long-term vision. So uh, what do you think about potential collaborations? How do you, how do you see that as, uh, you know, uh, being someone who has built this industry in Europe, but also um, uh, what can be done? And maybe I, I will open that question to Max and Ender as well. What can be done to um, uh, create these win-win situations with the, this part of the world? Yeah, I think Max already described it very well. Innovation is the DNA, the core DNA of this industry. And to create an, a, an innovative environment is what you have to have in mind if you want to be successful longer term in this industry. Now, the chicken and egg question is always, how do you create an innovative ecosystem? How does it begin? Does it start with, a, with an institute, with a research facility? Does it start with manufacturing? Frankly, I, my experience, what I have seen many times when, when, when you wanted or when, when somebody ventured on, on setting up a semiconductor uh, um, activity in a new country or in a new place, it usually starts 
with true business. You have to start with somebody who has all the ingredients to bring business to a marketplace. Once you have that, the ecosystem grows around it. It doesn't grow overnight. You can do a lot of things to accelerate that, and you probably have to do that. But once you do that, the ecosystem is going to grow. It begins with one, one first start, one company that is willing to set foot on a new ground. And the question is, how do you attract that? Um, in my experience and what I've seen lately, subsidies are no longer differentiating. Probably have never been. Now, as every region wants to bring semiconductors to their region, they want to have or participate in the fact that you have to have semiconductors to have a future, no matter what economy. It's no longer compute and consumer. It's an automotive, it's an industrial, it's everywhere. So if you want to participate in the oil of the next uh, era, then you want to have semiconductors. So you have to attract somebody. What does a semiconductor company need in order to, to come to a region? Well, when it's manufacturing involved, it needs infrastructure. It needs electricity, stable, cost-effective, and it needs water. Okay, you can provide that, but you have to provide it, of course, at competitive, at, uh, at competitive level. The second thing, you want to have political and other societal stability. You put, you, you, um, plant this or, or you, you, you plan this factory to be there for at least two decades. So you have to have a vision, is stability in the region, in the place, um, uh, something that you will have with very high likelihood. The third thing, and that becomes critical more and more, is do I have skilled workforce and talent and can I attract it to be in that region? That's very critical and that's actually something um, where a lot of um, areas are, are struggling with right now. Um, in, in Germany, it's a big talk because of Intel and, and TSMC coming and, and Finian and others investing heavily. Well, we're getting short on, on talent and, and creating that talent is, is essential. And for that, you need to probably invest early in um, building research facilities and making a, work, a, a workplace attractive. So when you have all of this done, um, then you basically need a partner, and we might be a partner to help with that. We've just founded uh, Celian Partners and working with Arian very closely on the first ever private equity semiconductor fund that's fully dedicated, dedicated to the semiconductor industry in order to help with finding those companies and building those bridges that are necessary to bring a company here. And when you do that, then I think the rest can fall in place if there is the vision and the, and the, I'd say, entrepreneurial spirit of the leaders in that region to drive all the necessary environment. So, yes, it's possible. Yes, it's a good time because there's a lot of movement in the industry, and, um, but there's also a lot of competition. So, um, it's not, uh, not a given that, um, uh, that, that uh, you can bring this industry to any country in the world where it's not yet. Uh, if I may, since this is the World Policy Conference, and quite frankly speaking, I'm not qualified to be making any policies, but uh, I think President Macron has a forum, which is Tech for Good. And, and if you look at the positive aspects that our industry can create and solve so many challenges in the society that we are going to be facing from climate change to food shortage to challenges for curing cancer and health disease. Um, on, honestly, yes, I'm, I'm the ambassador for the semiconductor industry, so I should speak good about it. But I think it's incumbent to all the leaders that are gathered here to have a policy about semiconductors because of the good that it can bring uh, to their societies besides the economic and the sovereignty issues, the value that it can bring by educating the workforce to have a stake in their future in, in, because the future more and more is being mapped by technology and by the way semiconductors are changing 
different applications from agri-food to life sciences, Handel very well mentioned. Um, I think between uh, genomics and proteomics, we are getting a complete map of the human body. And honestly, without semiconductors, that would have never been possible. So I think it's incumbent to all the leaders to think and craft a policy that is holistic for innovation and semiconductors. And not too many people in venture and financing are as versed in semiconductors as the two of you. So I'm glad that we are loaning some of our talent to the finance industry to help. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very uh, good transition to maybe open the door uh, for questions in the floor. I mean, uh, uh, I would like to stop here a little bit and, and see if, if you have questions that we could um, take on. Good morning, Stan Cosmo, Capgemini. Yesterday we heard about China and Taiwan. This morning we heard that TSMC is a, an important player in this industry. So two questions. What would be the potential consequences on your industry, on this industry? Should China take control of Taiwan, number one? And number two, what is being done to anticipate? Number two is? I didn't hear number two either. Number two is what is being done to anticipate that potential scenario? Okay. So we want to start. Uh, Ender, you want to start? Did, did you get the question? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I hear the question. Um, the reality is that if something negative happens to supply chain from Taiwan, the consequences are dramatic and drastic. And the reason is that if you look at the advanced technologies, TSMC has 90% of the market. And yeah, we do have attempts right now by Intel, by Samsung to build capacity. But if you look at the total capacity of TSMC in um, five nanometers and below, it's 300,000 wafers a month. 300,000 wafers a month. So. CHIPS Act will not solve that problem. The um, activities in Europe, frankly, will not solve that problem. So there's really nothing significant being done today if there is drastic reduction in supply chain from Taiwan in the next three to five years. And that's, that's a problem. Uh, and we think that the cost of addressing that can be up to $200 billion. Uh, but again, we think it's important to prevent it from happening, which requires diplomacy. And we do see lack of diplomacy in many areas at the present time, unfortunately. So since this is a World Policy Council, maybe there you have some smart people that can actually address this problem and provide diplomatic solutions because there are really no solid economic solutions in place at the present time. Yeah, I think I want to add to that question. Uh, um, leading edge, what's so-called leading edge technology, um, about 15 years ago, there was 10 plus companies who were competing for who is the first on leading edge. And, and the, uh, the Semiconductor technology develops in so-called nodes. It, it, it takes steps. And every step of the way, two to three of the companies fell off the wagon. They weren't able to keep up with the speed of development in the semiconductor industry. And that has led to the point where now it is three, or some say two and a half, I don't care, three companies left that are really fighting for leading edge. And TSMC is clearly leading the pack. Why do I say that? If somebody would have wanted to prevent the current situation, somebody would have needed to step in 20 years ago, at least 20 years ago. We haven't done that, and that's why we are where we are. Now a lot of things are done. Probably the most effective one is bringing TSMC's capability into several other places. Um, several things are done, but it takes years, three to five at least, 
to be somewhat less, somewhat less dependent on the current, uh, as compared to the current situation. So that's just a matter of the fact, and, and we can, all we can do is, is do whatever we can to really um, uh, grow our independence or become less dependent uh, from the current situation. And a lot of efforts are done, um, and I agree with, uh, I wouldn't probably formulate it as drastically as Handel does, uh, as to the TIPS acts are not going to cut it, but they will be a contribution, but they will not be sufficient. There needs, it lot, needs a lot more than that to really grow that independence. Or come, you can, uh, you can uh, formulate it more positively to, to strengthen the capability of the rest of the world in comparison to what is in Taiwan. My two cents, first of all, I encourage you to believe in the good of people. Uh, I, I, I am a naturally optimistic person. Even though bad news sells better commercials, I, I hope you can focus on the good. Um, yes, if you are going to scenario plan and scenario for the worst case scenario, if there is a disruption in supply from ta Taiwan on the most advanced nodes, considering that the most advanced node production in Taiwan sums up to 80 plus percent, Yes, we will have globally a problem. That said, I agree with Helmut, the CHIPS Act's intention is to remedy that. And let's hope that that's a remote possibility that the CHIPS Act just remedy that. Uh, furthermore, you have to realize how did we get here. Semiconductor industry was maximizing cost for the last 40 years, and as a result, you wake up in the United States, I live in San Francisco, the birthplace of integrated circuit, and we found ourselves with absolutely zero manufacturing in California. Well, it was because we wanted to optimize for cost. Today, the optimization needs to be based on other factors, and the industry, with veterans like you guys, are working on reshifting it without truly sacrificing the cost and uh, the benefits that it's brought with it. So we are working in the industry very diligently. I just came from <coughs> Handel and I were in Honolulu two days ago in, in a conference of CEOs. We are, as an industry, focused on making sure we plan for the worst case scenario. Uh, but we are also conscious that some of the geopolitical tensions are outside our control. Thank you. Maybe there is another question in the medium. Yeah. Good morning, Jean-Pierre Cabestan from Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, I have a question to, well, to the whole panel, but maybe more to handle. Uh, do you think the restrictions uh, introduced by the Biden administration in terms of semiconductors uh, transfer to China will help the U.S. to keep an edge over China? Uh, that's my first question. The second part of the question is about the EU or European manufacturers or, or designers of semiconductors. How much Europe can stay away or stay outside of these, uh, these restrictions and what the EU is doing to... Um, you know, prevent China to, from catching up. Andrew, do you start? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think the U.S. Chips Act is has some positives. It basically does now recognize the importance of semiconductors. The amount of funding for manufacturing is like thirty-nine billion. There are five hundred applicants though for for funding. So I think it's really good that the, that the uh, leaders understand the importance of semiconductors. We see the same thing in Europe, uh, basically, again, an understanding of the importance of semiconductors. What China is doing is accelerating development of mature technologies and trying to do what companies do in advanced technologies in more mature technologies. An example is the Mate 60 of Huawei which was done pretty much with uh, 
full China technology. It's seven nanometers. Apple right now is a three nanometer, so two or three generations behind. So China is putting big emphasis into trying to be as self-sufficient as possible. And we think over the next three or four years, that's going to work. Longer term, though, there will be problems. So I think it's really good that the world really understands the importance of semiconductors. And what we do see in Europe, and we actually do work with some European companies, we do see high level of innovation. I mean, right now, ST, uh, Micro, is the leader in silicon carbide. And uh, this is for autonomous vehicles. And they're actually a leader by a significant amount. I mean, the difference between number two and number one is pretty big. Maybe Infineon might dispute that, but again, that's our opinion. Um, <laughs> but Europe is also very strong, as I said, in sensors. And sensors are really important in terms of applications. So I think it's really very good that we are getting this uh, political attention. But the costs, though, of participating in advanced technologies are so high. An example for you is that to put in capacity of 50,000 wafers a month in two nanometers cost $30 billion. For 28 nanometers, 10 years ago, it was $3 billion, 10x. So the cost of participation is going up. The rewards, though, also go up because, of course, you get big revenue. So I'm very positive in the fact that we are recognizing the problems. And there are specialty areas that um, they do not re do not require advanced technologies uh, that basically have very high growth. In addition to silicon carbide, we see gallium nitride having high growth. Uh, basically, the the sensors, as I mentioned, have high growth potential. So, yeah, I think the the the, the recognition, and I, I agree. You know, we should have looked at this problem 20 years ago, but we are looking at it now, and hopefully, we can we can. Uh, Ha not have significant political supply chain disruptions. Because frankly, if there is disruption from Taiwan, it's going to be bad for China as well as for the US and also for Europe. So it's going to be bad globally. So hopefully, sane minds will not result in catastrophe. But again, I think when, when you plan certain things, you have to look at different options. The optimistic, realistic, pessimistic, and very pessimistic. So again, hopefully we won't have catastrophe. But again, I think, uh, as Helmut said, we should have planned this 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago. But we are now doing things. And so maybe in the future, we'll be in better shape. Thank you. Maybe the last questions. Yes, the, f the, the last question. Yes. We are talking about a semiconductor, but where are we with a superconductor? Are we still very far from, or are we, are we almost uh, there? <laughs> yes. uh, well, first of all, as, as, as it was mentioned before, this industry has been, it should get the Nobel Prize for genius inventions over the last four years. So we are diligently working on new materials. I was with the CEO of Intel two weeks ago, and he was not joking, saying that we are using only one third of periodic table. We have still have two thirds to go. <laughs> and, and, and we will definitely go there. Um, I think supercomputers uh, goes as Francois is working on it, is quantum computing platform. Uh, right now, the latest and the greatest is about 100 qubits that is being produced. But uh, quite honestly speaking, I think Francois' team is counting on 50 to 100 qubits, and, and Sandbox is one of the best out there. Uh, we are working as an industry to bring supercomputers because uh, right now what Sandbox is doing on drug discovery uh, what would have taken a number of years, it's being done in less than four hours with that number of qubits. So the industry is making humongous progress, 
but what is needed for the progress is to have an environment that innovation can happen and the geopolitics is only getting in the middle of it, creating redundancies across the globe, getting in the middle of it, not being able to collaborate with the best minds gets in the middle of it. But as an industry, since I'm an optimist, I would say stay tuned to this channel. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe as a quick conclusion, I mean, I think that you all understand that um, this industry is really supporting the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years in terms of uh, applications that will be around us. And uh, we have all these verticals that are really supporting by semiconductors. And uh, clearly, innovation is at the bottom of it. Innovation brings leadership, and uh, there is a new parameters today, I mean, this leadership is also equivalent to sovereignty. So if you want to play even in the policy world, I mean, it's very important now to be very, very active in t into this industry. There is room, okay, there is room because the, this industry is now, as we said, transforming itself. We are moving from globalization to regionalization, and we believe that uh, the, the Gulf region has a big, um, big place to take uh, on this race. So that's the end of it. Thank you very much for attending this. Thank you, Andrew.